Hi, I'm so excited. Here we are. Philippians chapter two. We're already moving along. So praise God. I um, just love this book so much, so much. So we're going to just dive right in here. We're going to start out right here in uh, verse chapter one. It just kind of reminds you guys of some things that we were talking about before. One of the last things that Paul had said to us before, you know, we got, we're, we're getting to where we are now was just remember that um, our salvation was granted to us, but also suffering is granted to us. And so oftentimes we will have conflict and it's not always outside, inter outside interferences that come in with this conflict. Oftentimes, because the enemy knows if he can disrupt unity, if he can disrupt the body of Christ, that having internal con conflict will break down the very foundation of everything that the Holy Spirit is trying to build through the body. And that one of our greatest witnesses to a lost and dying world is our unity, is true unity built on love, built on Christ. And so What's happening here is Paul has gotten word that two of the women that he had been laboring with um, were not walking in unity. They were um, they were having some type of schism and it was causing um, starting to cause disunity because they were conflicting. And it was uh, Eurodia and Synthakai. I didn't look up their words to pronounce them properly because so we'll get to them later, actually. But so I just want to kind of build that up, though, that Paul is going to address unity and the and the importance of unity, which he addresses in every letter he writes, because Christ addresses unity. Unity is so important. How will they even know that who are his true disciples? Because of the love they have for one another. And one of his final prayers that Jesus had with the Father in John chapter 17 was unify them, Lord. Let them be in unity. Because if we're not in unity, then we cannot fully get done what needs to be done. And our witness is very poor at that point. So we're going to talk a lot about unity today. But I love what Paul does here. He doesn't necessarily address the problem head on so much as he is going to point everything. He's going to remind us why we need to be in unity and where that unity comes from. And so let's just kind of delve into that. It says in verse one, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any if any fellowship of the spirit, if any affections, affection and mercy. And so he's saying, listen, if in this word, if here is actually can be um, and should be uh, meant to be since. So therefore, since there is any consolation in Christ, since you have this encouragement in Christ, since you have Christ's comfort because of the love that he has for you, since you have the Holy Spirit and he has brought you into this fellowship with one another and he has brought this affection and mercy that you should be having for one another. So the word if there should be interchangeable with sense is what he's saying because we do have that. We do have encouragement in Christ and the finished work of the cross. We do have his love that is so persuasive that we to be persuaded to walk as he walked, to walk in holiness, to walk in righteousness, to walk in love, and to walk in unity. Christ's love alone should be enough to persuade us to become who we are called to become. And so, and because we have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the one that has put, brought us into this beautiful fellowship with one another. You know, God puts his bride together, the universal bride, but also the local bride. It is by no accident that you are doing life with the people that you're doing life with, that you're building God's kingdom with the people that you're building God's kingdom. That was no accident. God put all of those people together. He put that, that ministry together. And so here's Paul, you know, he's going to start really showing why it's so important for that unity to stay together to fulfill the purposes of God. But he's going to use Christ to get their minds 
our minds focused off of ourselves, off of the problem, off of uh, the earthly mindedness that we all get embedded in. It's so easy to get our minds focused off of heavenly things because the earth is right here and it's so tangible to us that it seems to be, it seems to something we got to fight all the time. But he says, you know, so he's going to, so he's pointing all of us back to Christ, focusing back on Christ. He says, verse two, fulfill my joy. I love this. Here's Paul in prison. You know, they loved Paul. We've talked about that, how they supported him. They loved him. He loved them. But he's, he's like, do me a solid here. I'm in prison and it, it, it breaks my heart to think that there could be disunity going on over there in that in the church that I established in that church of Philippi, the first church of Europe right he knew what this church was going to be the first this was going to be the fire starter and this that that church is literally the fire starter to where you and I have the gospel in the west here in America today and all of that could have been stopped if disunity came into the ministry, it came into what God was putting together. This is serious stuff. And he says, fulfill my joy. Continue with my joy. I really need you guys to do what it takes to come together and to unify and, 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 and stay unified. And he goes on to say, being like-minded or being Christ-like minded. That's what that means. To be have the mind of Christ in this situation. Everyone needs to go, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And I know that was like a popular thing, like 25 years ago, everybody wore the bracelets and the and the necklaces and whatnot. And, and it was WWJD, what would Jesus do? And that's what Paul's saying here. He was really the first person to, to throw out there for us to think about, what would Jesus do? What would he do? We need to be Christ-minded in this. We need to have the same love, being of one accord. We need to be on the same page, one goal. What is the goal? We have this local body that comes together. What is the goal? The goal is to imitate Jesus Christ. The goal is to um, love one another, to walk in unity, to, to be of one mind of what the gospel is to worship together in one mind, the Christ who saved us, who came and, and died for us, to be of one mind over the scriptures, over the learning of these scriptures, what they do in Acts 2 and 4. They labored over the apostles' teachings in unity. They served together. They went house to house, breaking bread together. They worshiped together. They became a community and a family. Now, he wants us to come into this same love, which is supernatural, that agape love that we're all filled with when we become born again, to be reminded that we have this love, the love that comes from Christ that has been poured into us. Remember Romans 5, God's love has just been poured into us and we should be, it should be outpouring from us. And we do this in one mind and one accord. We should have the same goal, love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength love each other, right? Love our neighbor as ourselves, love one another, laying ourselves down for each other, and then go make Christ known to the world. We cannot make Christ truly known to the world if we are not fulfilling one and two. If we're not loving God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength individually, and then coming together and loving one another the way that God loves us, what kind of witness are we to the outside world? And this, and the enemy knows this. That's why he has come in to divide and conquer. And we have allowed him to. We've allowed him to. And, and, and the reason why we've allowed him to, verse three, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each other esteem others better than themselves. How does the enemy come in? He starts to get people thinking of themselves, their own interests, what I want, what I need, what I, what I prefer. And that was that he starts putting that into the mind, get the mind focused off of Christ. And now I'm, it's all about me. It's all about what I prefer. It's all about what I want. And it becomes I-ism. 
And we are so individualistic here in the West that we don't really have a sense of community like like we used to back in the day. And also like people around the world, well, um, it's because their culture is different. Our culture is very individualistic. Our culture is very me-centered. Our culture is very building my own kingdom centered. And so we have filtered that into the church. It's all about me, myself, and I. What can I get? What can what benefits me? What's best for me? And we don't think of the others. We don't think of what our decisions, how it, they are going to affect other people. And we're to think of others greater than ourselves. It's not a false humility like, you know, purposely putting ourselves down to lift other people up. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, I think of your needs greater than my own. I think of how my decision may affect you. I think of, you know, what I have to do today, but maybe you need something. It's thinking of others greater than ourselves. It takes great humility and sacrifice to do this. But this is the heart of the Christian. Why is it the heart of the Christian? We're going to get into that. Verse five, let this mind, this Christ likeness, this Christ mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Paul is not asking us to do anything that Christ himself did not do. This is the pattern. This is the example that we have. God himself coming down. And that's what we're going to talk about, coming down and giving up of his own desires and his will. Thinking of us greater than himself. And he's God. Oh, gosh, guys, we've got to get this together. So let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This was in Christ Jesus, that we are to think of each other better than ourselves, that we're not to be looking after our own interests. If I'm going to do this, how's this going to affect the rest of the body? If I'm not going to do this, how's it going to affect the rest of the body? What are my actions and my decisions doing to the rest of the body? You know, we're going to have personality conflicts. We're going to have, you know, you know, different types of things. And one thing I want to say here, which is really important before we go on to the next section is unity is not uniformity. They're not the same thing. So uniformity is a false unity or a unity that says we're, we're unified because we all wear skirts and we all don't cut our hair and not, we all don't wear makeup and we all drive the same car or we all believe the exact same thing. We all don't eat pork or we all do eat pork or we all, that's uniformity. True unity, true unity is allowing each other to be different, but yet unified in love in Christ. We are unified in the essentials. That's what brings forth that unity. You can't be unified if you're not unified in the essentials of Jesus Christ. Uniformity is a dictatorship. Like we all have to do this in order to be unified. That's not true unity. Unity is being able to be individual and yet be one. It's, I don't, I can, I can wear a skirt and you can wear pants. I can wear makeup and you can decide to wear no makeup. I can eat pork and you can decide to not eat pork. As long as we're not saying it's a salvation issue or we're not putting each other on a higher tier and saying, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a better Christian than you because I wear a skirt and you don't, you know, that goes back to, you know, Romans 14 and 15, which you guys can go back and listen to that lesson. But what this is saying is that we are unified in Christ in love and that we can look past each other's differences, past each other's personality quirks, past each other's preferences. Like I prefer this kind of music, but I prefer this kind of music, you know, is what we need to fight for is the unity in Christ the unity of the gospel, the unity of the Christ. Do we all believe that Jesus is fully God and fully man? Yes, praise God. And if you don't, then that is an essential doctrine and you need to learn it. And if you still disagree with it, then that's a salvation issue. 
do we all confirm and believe that Christ, that God, that Christ is God, that he always was God, was God on earth, is God and still God in heaven? Do we believe that? Do we affirm Christ's deity? Yes, that's an essential. We have to have that. We cannot have unity if we do not have these essentials. Do we believe that the atonement was on the cross? It was finished at the cross. Yes. He did not go into hell and then suffer for three days like a lot of these false teachers teach. It was finished on the cross. Do we believe in the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ? Not a spirit. Not that he came back as a spirit. He didn't reincarnate. He came back physically and bodily. It's an essential. We have to believe that. Do you believe in the inerrant word of God that the Bible is sufficient? It has no contradictions. It is 100% God breathed and it is our final authority. That is an essential. Do you believe in the virgin birth? That is an essential. Christ, it had to come from a virgin birth. He could not have a sperm to have created him because then he would have had the sin of Adam, this Adam's nature, and he does not have Adam's nature. That's how he is still fully God and fully man. These are essentials. Do we believe in the, the Godhead or the triunity or the Trinity? God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit operating as one God, but three separate and unique persons. Just because our mind can't fully comprehend it doesn't mean the Bible doesn't teach it. And that's not true. These are the things that Orthodox Christianity has always held to. People have died for these essentials. And so we have to hold fastly to that. So if we agree on those, if we agree on the essentials of the faith, then we need to work at the unity among the body of Christ. This is vital. And this is going to take us laying down our pride, our egos, our selfish desires, our personal preferences, and get our minds, and this is what Paul wants them to do, get your mind refocused on Christ refocused on the goal refocused on him and building his kingdom these other things we can show each other liberty we can show each other charity we can you know lovingly debate through some of these things but still love one another we need to hold fast to to the essentials and show each other charity and liberty in the non-essentials and say, we're going to fight for unity because we want to be a witness to the world of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. It is how the world's going to know us is by our love and unity because everything is divided. Everyone is divided. But when they see a body of believers that can come together from different walks of life, from different stages of life and different ages and different backgrounds and different, and they come together and they just love one another and they just fight to stay together as a family and as a community so that they can get the work done that needs to get done for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is a true witness to the world because that is supernatural. But it takes everyone laying down their lives for one another and thinking of each other greater than themselves. It takes great humility to just talk to each other, to just come together as a family, to, to, to just hammer out things that maybe aren't uh, biblical or aren't being done this way. Or maybe you do have a preference, but, you know, bring it to the table and let's hash it out and see if we can correct it or make it better or just go, hey, my preference ain't going to get met and that's okay. It's not about me, whatever it is, right? And that's what God, that's what Jesus prayed for. And that's what God expects of us. And this is what Paul is about ready to hammer home here is the, the importance of this unity to come together in Jesus Christ, to love each other more than we love ourselves to think of each other greater than ourselves. If a ministry can come together and do that, they can transform the world. They can transform the city. And that's what that's how Christianity did grow and, and, and go so quickly. It was like a fire that just could not be put out. It's because they were unified from Pentecost 
excuse me, from Pentecost and on, they were unified. And their love they had for one another, they laid everything down at the apostles' feet so that no one had a need. And they weren't fighting over these non-essential things. And they were dedicated to one another. They weren't trying to go off and have their own lives and their own you know, way that they want to do church and the way that they think it's okay. And they weren't rebellious. They, they were unified together and they couldn't wait to be together. Whether it was a Sunday at a house church, whether it was a Saturday at the temple, whether it was Monday through Friday doing house to house or going out and evangelizing or whether it was in prison and they had to be in prison waiting for the lions to come, waiting to be fed to the lions, waiting to be crucified for their faith. They were unified because they loved Christ. They loved Christ, number one, and they had such a love for one another. They understood what it meant to be the church. So we have verse seven. Okay, so we go on for who being the form of, I'm sorry, verse six. So verse five, let his mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider a robbery to be equal with God. Jesus, to say that he is the form of God is literally saying, I am God. I always was, I am, and I always will be God. But he didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God. He is God in the flesh. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. But Jesus is not the father and the father is not the son. Hence the triunity or tri trinity or Godhead, if you will. So what he's saying here is he positionally, he positionally was, is God and he is, his personal identity is God, but he was willing to lay down his position for a season to come down here and have a new position. What is that new position? Bond slave, servant, and become lesser in the sense of position to God the Father. He was willing to come down here, put on it to, to become fully human. He didn't let go of his divinity. We'll talk about that. Become fully human. To be spit on, to be mocked, to be beaten. See, the father didn't go through that. The father didn't come down and become spit on and beaten and mocked. Jesus did. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. Positionally, he submitted his will to the will of the father. So personally, he is still the person of God. He is still the second person of the Trinity, fully God. But positionally, he changed his position from hanging out in heaven, being uh, in glory, positionally with the father and comes down and now takes on a new position of bond servant, of slave. And this is so beautiful. And I love this because Jesus is God. It is, and Paul understood this. All the apostles understood this. The early church understood this. The scriptures clearly teach this. Jesus did not cease to be God when he came down here and put on the human tent he did not cease to be God. He never ceased to be God. And he always was God. He created all things. All things are created through him, by him, and for him. Colossians. So verse seven, but he made himself of no reputation. See, God could have came down, put on a human tent, and then built a whole empire, right? He could have just taken out Rome and become the new Roman uh, emperor, he could have become the head of J Jerusalem. He could have taken out the, the, the Sadducees and Pharisees and the high priest because he is the high priest. And he could have just built a kingdom, but that's not what he came for. Not this time. That's next. Next time he comes, he's going to have build a, he's going to bring forth his kingdom and we're having a new heaven, a new earth. And he he's the king, kings and the Lord, the Lord's forever. Woo! Cannot wait for that time. Okay. So, but he didn't give himself a reputation. He came as the lowest form in that society, which was taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. That is, oh, can we grasp that for a minute? God himself, the creator of the universe, 
who told the ocean where to stop, who told the mountains where to peak, who put every star in place, created this vast universe that we can't, it's infinite, can't even explore it to its completeness because it's just infinite and just profound and it and, and, and has scientists and biologists and just, just studying it their whole lives and they're still only scratching the surface. Wasn't that long ago we just discovered DNA. And then we have these little machines that are literally like their own little factories. Each DNA is its own little factory of uniqueness. It's a building block. It's magnificent. We're discovering more and more the magnificence of God. And here he, he came down from glory to save God-hating, wretched men and women like you and me. To be a servant. He could have came down and, like I said, gave himself a reputation and, and saved us, if he so choose. He humbled himself and became a slave to us all. And he came as a man to identify with us his creation, his prideful, arrogant, self-centered, me, me, and more of me creation. Blows my mind. Absolutely blows my mind. And you have to picture this, what Paul is saying. Remember in the upper room, the disciples are sitting there arguing about who is the greatest. They're standing in the presence of God, their Savior, their Messiah, and they're arguing about who is the greatest in the kingdom. Who's going to be best? Who's going to be the greatest one? What does Jesus do? He takes the towel of a servant's, a servant's towel wraps it around himself and bends down and starts washing their feet. These prideful, arrogant men who have been walking with him all these years, who have seen the greatest humility and love and teaching and miracles, and they are arguing about who is going to be the greatest among God. The only person in that room and ever to walk this earth that deserves to be served is God. None of us deserve to be served. And yet here's Jesus stooping down and doing the work and the job of a servant in that culture to wash their dirty feet. And here's what Paul is bringing back to their remembrance when they're having disunity when they can't lay down their own pride and egos and preferences and how they want things done, they can't think bigger than themselves. And they're will and, and, and these two women are willing to wreck what God is trying to put together, what God is trying to do in that local church and that local community of Philippi, and how that community can touch other communities that then touch other communities that can touch the world if they would just remain unified what are they arguing about who's greater which woman's greater who's the better cook we don't know they don't tell us what they're arguing about because you know what the matter at the end of the day i think they purposely don't god purposely doesn't tell us what these two women are arguing about because at the end of the day it doesn't matter they're still causing division when it could very well rip the fabric of this church apart because they can't think of others greater than themselves Their minds are off Christ. Their minds are off what Christ himself came and did for you and for me and for them so that we could have this unity and family and community so that we could go and build the kingdom of God together. And being found, verse 8, in appearance as a man, he humbled himself 
and came became obedient to the point of death, even the death. God came down. 100% God. He did not leave his deity. He did not let go of his deity. He was still God. And then he puts on a human tent and becomes 100% man, becomes fully man. And that alone is so humbling and so mind-blowing. He didn't just stop there. He served while he was here, day and night, giving all of himself, everything that he had. And he had he was limited in his in his earth, in his um in his uh, human nature. He still thirsted, he still got hungry. You know, his body would have gotten tired. He poured himself out day and night for his disciples, for the people that were following him, for the crowds of people who who needed him to continue to teach and, and, and point them to the Father in heaven and the new kingdom that's going to come. And, and he poured himself out, but then... He humbles himself even further by being completely obedient to going to a criminal's cross. If Jesus just would have wanted to teach us and, and guide us and give us a pattern to go after. No, he went further than that. He willingly went up to a criminal's cross with no offense, completely sinless. They mocked him. They, they bared false witness about him. They spit on him. They beat him so mercilessly that he didn't even, uh, he didn't even appear human by the time they got done beating him. He was unrecognizable. They plucked his beard and pulled his hair and put a crown of thorns on him. God in the flesh. He could have called a he could have called a, a, a legion of angels to stop it all. He could have just judged the whole earth right then and there and just destroyed everything and started over if he wanted to, or not start anything ever again. He's God. He can do what he wants. But his love for you and for me kept him on that cross. And he died. He drank the cup of wrath for you and for me. I was the sinner. I was the one that owed the debt. I'm the one that blasphemed God. I'm the one that, that was prideful and arrogant and, and, and a sinner and a fornicator and adulterer and whatever put your name in it. I'm the one. I'm the one that deserved the criminal's cross, not Christ. He humbled himself. This is what Paul is trying to get us to understand. Humble yourself. If you want to be a leader in the kingdom of God, you're going to be a servant to all. If you want to be a child of God, it's going to cost you your own desires, your own, your own will, your own everything. He humbled himself to the point of death on a cross so that you and I could be set free from sin and the penalty of sin and be reconciled back to the Father. And here we are, here they are, arguing about things that don't matter. They matter, but they don't matter. You know what I mean? We're dividing over things that we should never divide over. We're, we're, we're tearing down what God is trying to build up because of our own selfishness. I want to do it my way. I don't want to do it that way. I don't want to have to submit. I don't want to submit to the elders that God's put in place. I don't want to submit to one another. I don't like how he teaches. I don't like how she teaches. I don't like what, you know, that music that they're, I don't like, uh, see, what, what do you, what's the common theme there? I, I, I. That is not what Jesus was saying. It was not I, I, I when he put, came down from glory and put on that tent. It was you, you, you. 
It was about Father's will and Christ submitted himself to the will and he came willingly for you. And that's what Paul's trying to get their minds back on this perspective. That compared to whatever it is you're arguing about right now, ladies, whatever it is you guys are, are, are causing division about, whatever it is you've let the enemy come in and, and, and do, please don't let it rip apart the unity and the love of this, of this church that God has built together, that God has built up, that the Holy Spirit, what he's saying in the beginning, that the Holy Spirit has brought into fellowship. He uniquely chose the different people to bring to this one church in Philippi. And then to do his work with it, to be a family, you didn't choose your mom and dad and your brothers and sisters and your aunts and uncles and your cousins, right? God chose that. It's no different. God chose the local body. God chose your brothers and sisters and your spiritual mom and dad and your, your aunties and your cousins and the kids that were going to come to get God chose. And he put us together and he said, love each other, stay in unity and go build my church, go build my kingdom. But what are we doing? We're not thinking of others greater than ourselves. We got selfish, we get prideful. And we took our minds off Christ and off the word and the commands. And that's exactly what happens. And that's what was happening in this church. And it was very concerning to Paul. And it, and it didn't, he wasn't going to do 10 points on why to stay in unity or five ways to avoid conflict or six ways to deal with conflict in the church. Cause that's what we would do today. We'd have our, our, our we'd have our, uh, you know, our pinpoint thingy up on the screen and we'd have these six bullet points and conflict re resolution and ways to communicate better. And right now that's all he did. I want to do that. He reminded them of the God that they serve, of the God that saved them. He brought it back to Christ and reminded them what it means to be the church, what it means to be in Christ, what it means to be a family and a community and what Christ first did so that we can too do. That's what Paul did. He's taken it back to the cross, back to Christ. Because we need to grow up and we need to mature in this area as a body, as professing believers. We need to repent and turn from the division and the disunity that we've allowed the enemy to come in and cause in our lives, in our churches, in our ministries and families, and we need to get focused back on Christ and him crucified, focus back on the job, the ministry of reconciliation that's been given to all of us as a steward, because the church has lost her witness. The, the church, especially in the West, has lost her witness, because we don't love one another, and we're not walking in unity. Oh, we can walk in uniformity, we're good at walking in uniformity, put, laying down a bunch of laws and tr man's traditions and regulations, and it's all uniformed in that. But that's not true unity. True unity is being able to look past our own selves and to love somebody right where they're at and stay unified with them for the greater goal. And we can only do this with the supernatural power of God, the Holy Spirit. But if we're not submitted to the Spirit, Roman eight, Romans 8, what's going to happen exactly what the enemy wants to happen this unity so that we can't accomplish what god has ordained for us to accomplish has called us to accomplish there's lost and dying souls out there that need the unified church to come back together There's a lot of broken families and broken people. And there's a lot of broken Christians that are alone and, and hurting because of the selfishness and pride of others within the church. And we need to come back together, universally and locally. Amen, right? Amen.
So therefore, verse nine, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name, which is above every name. Christ humbled himself and God the Father has exalted Christ back to his rightful position to be the Lord over all, to be the Lord over all. So as we, we talk about, um, you know, think about, we didn't really kind of go over it yet, but, you know, verse seven, where it says, but he made himself of no reputation or in the ESV, he emptied himself. That's literally what we call kenosis or him emptying himself so that God will then exalt him. But I want to talk about that kenosis real quick. So he's being found in the appearance of man, being humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even onto the cross. So there's the big debate. Well, what did he empty himself of? What did he empty himself of? There's a lot of false teaching around this that literally um, is heresy. And one of it is the kenosis theology, where people say that he emptied himself of being God. And that is the furthest thing from the truth. He did not empty himself of being God. He did not empty himself of his deity. He is still fully God. As he's walking on the earth, he was still fully God. He's still fully God today and fully man. What he did was, because it says here, he went on to be a bond servant. So he emptied himself positionally. He veiled his glory because if he wouldn't have veiled that glory, we wouldn't have been able to look upon him. He made himself a slave and he submitted his will to the father. So positionally, he did not cease to be God or give up any portion of his divine nature. This is vital, you guys. If you're paying attention to a lot of these teachers out there that are on television or um, really famous, I'm not going to name names, but you'll notice that they teach that Jesus was not God while he was on this earth. Then they'll go on to teach that he became Satan or became possessed by Satan or took on the nature of Satan at the cross. If you hear those kind of phrases, you are dealing with a false teacher. Jesus is God and God cannot be possessed by Satan. Jesus is God and cannot take on the nature of Satan. That would be being possessed. Jesus did not cease to be God while on the cross. He had to be fully God on the cross because he had to be the perfect lamb of God, the perfect sinless lamb in order to be slain for you and me. He also had to be fully man in order to represent humanity and to be the high priest. He was fully God and fully man. That never ceased when he emptied himself or humbled himself to come to this earth and put on the human tent. This is so important, you guys. He did not get tortured by demons in hell for three days. He said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Today, right now. It's not hard to, that is not hard to understand. Today means today. Today you'll be with who? Me, Christ, Jesus in, in heaven. He went into Hades, we believe, to grab the keys of, of hell to say, listen, I conquered it. You know, we can talk about that another time. We talk about that when I, and Peter, uh, you can go through my um, Peter's teachings on Peter. Um, we talk more about that. But he did not get tortured by demons, and that is not where your atonement is, okay? He did not become born again after the resurrection. He did not need to become born again. He was not a sinner. He's not a sinner. We need to be born again. We need to be regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Being born again is to be regenerated by the Holy Spirit, to be sealed by the Holy Spirit, to be justified before the Father. And so it's really important that you have your theology here correct because there are so many false teachers that are teaching a different Jesus. 
Jesus is fully God. He always was God. He was God while he was here on earth. He is God. He was God on the cross. He was God when he resurrected. He is God now today, sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he is coming back as God. He is eternal and transcendent. He always was, always will be the eternal God. But he did empty himself positionally of his position in heaven to become lower he humbled himself to become a servant. He did not empty himself of his personhood. He, you, he can't empty himself of his personhood. He is who he is. He is God. But he emptied himself of his position temporarily. And now he's going, now he's, well, not now. Now he's already there. But even when he tells the apostles, like, I'm going back to the father. He's going back to his rightful position. And they were so sad. And he's like, no, this is a good thing. And then I'm, and then we're going to send the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's going to come. You know, it's going to be all good. All good. And so he does this to the death on the death of the cross. This is so important. And because it's important to understand this as we go to the next section here. Verse nine. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him. Okay. So he humbled himself, emptied himself of that position. He veiled his glory, though his glory was revealed, remember, on the Mount of Transfiguration, and they saw his glory and they, they could handle it? Yes. So it got unveiled for a second, but that's what was veiled, his glory. The true, his true glory was veiled. Um, and he did that in humility to become a bond, slave, bond servant for you and me and submitted his will to the Father for you and me. Okay, so now here's God, the father who has highly exalted him and given him the name, which is above every name. Now, some people think, well, that that name is Jesus or that name is Joshua, which Joshua is just Joshua, which there's a lot of people named Joshua back then. And so um, it's not necessarily the 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 name spelled out, you know, what the name is. It's what does the name represent? And that's where you say, what does the name represent? Lord, Lord of all the universe, Lord over the entire universe where every knee will bow. That's what the father's talking about. That's what he exalted him to, to the highest status of being the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, the supreme being over all the universe and every tongue will confess it. It doesn't mean every tongue is going to be saved. It doesn't mean every knee that bows is going to be saved. But every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. And every knee will bow and in, in come into agreement that Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, the God, eternal, transcendent Savior, Messiah, anointed one, creator of everything. I willingly bow right now and say, I already confess that. I confess that you are Lord. I confess that you are God of the universe. That you are the creator. You are my Messiah. You are my savior. And I, and I am submitted to your Lordship right now. That needs to be the heart of every believer. Is he just your savior or is he your Lord? Because Lord means master and master means we're submitted as bond servants of Jesus Christ. That we think of others greater than ourselves, that we think of his will to be done and not our own will. We're willing to lay aside our desires and our will and submit it to him just as he submitted to the father. This is what Paul is reminding them of here, guys, that, that, that this disunity that, that, that could potentially wreck what Paul had established here, what God's trying to do here, because of two people who are unwilling to submit to God and submit to one another, it could break down the very fabric of this local ministry. And so here's God. He's got, he says, he highly exalted him, given the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on the earth, 
And even though it's beneath the earth, and the beneath the earth are what we believe are the demons and Satan and uh, unholy angels or demons or whatever they are, disembodied spirits, right? Um, and so he's saying there is not going to be any anything that's not going to bow a knee and confess that Jesus is Lord. It's going to touch all of creation. And that's what God says. He says, you know, he exalts the humble, but he takes down the proud. And that's what these women were being. When you've got conflict, when you have, when you're in disagreements with one another, when you are not unified with one another, that there's pride. Somebody's got pride. Somebody's taking their eyes off Jesus and put it back and put it on themselves and what and they their wants and their interests and their what what they want. We've taken our eyes off of Christ and put them on ourselves. And we need to get our eyes back off ourselves and back on Christ. Because imitate me, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. He says we ought to be imitators of Christ. It says, be holy for he is holy. We are to be obedient children. We are children of God. We are sons and daughters of God. So we need to reflect God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy Spirit. We need to reflect that family that we've been adopted into. Reflect that name above all names. And we're in disunity. We're not reflecting Christ. And we're not reflecting the beautiful unity of the Trinity. Father, son, Holy Spirit work perfectly united together in perfect love and perfect unity to get done what they have determined to get done. And one of those things is salvation. Father has a part to play in the salvation. The son has a part to play in our salvation. The Holy Spirit has a part to play in the salvation. And if you want to learn more about that, go listen to Romans chapter eight teachings on YouTube. Oh, powerful, beautiful to see how the father and the son and the Holy spirit all work together, each having their own part in our salvation, but they do it perfectly in unity. And that is what expects of. We are a reflection. We are an extension of the triune God. Christ is the head and we are his body. And so we are expected as Paul is saying here to work together in unity to lay down our own interests and own desires, our own will, and submit to one another. He even says that in 1 Peter, submit to your elders and submit to one another. God has put people in place to do different jobs, different, we have different positions, different plays, different giftings, and we should all be working together to get the will of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit plan done we're a body and he says and that every tongue should confess that jesus christ is lord to the glory god the father this is what brings god the father glory you guys not just confessing that jesus is lord not just saying that i'm a christian not just saying oh yeah he's lord he's god i believe that i believe jesus is god oh yeah and i go and live the way i want to live i go and serve the way i want to serve I'm not really connected to a local body, a local community. I'm not, you know, working in unity with a group of people, no matter how small, no matter how big, I'm not working together with this group of people where I'm submitted to the elders that God has put in place and I'm submitted to each other and we're submitted to each other. And we are loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength together. We are loving each other as we're to love our neighbors. And then we're going out and loving the lost and loving the world. This isn't Burger King. We can't just have it our way. Christianity is not Burger King. That is that is the society that we live in, though. I want everything done my way. I want it done through a microwave because I want it quickly. I want it done. Um, I expect it done. And I deserve it. And we become consumers. We're Consumerism. We're all about what we want, how fast we can get it, 
when we want it done our way, we want it to look our way and be our way. And if you won't give it to me, then I'll just go over here and I'll get it over here. If Walmart doesn't have what I want, I'll just go to Target. And if Target doesn't have what I want, I'll go to Kohl's. And if Kohl's doesn't have what I want, I'll go online. I'll go to Amazon now. I mean, my gosh, I can get anything delivered within 24 to 48 hours from Amazon. I can get it fast. I can get it how I want it. And I want customer service. If it doesn't exactly how I like it or have it done, I'm taking it back and I expect customer service and a refund and $6,000 for my inconvenience. That is our mindset. And we have taken that mindset into the church. And it's created a poor witness. And we're displeasing the father. We're not pleasing father. We're not bringing glory to the father. We're not bringing glory to the to God who saved us. We can't be. I don't care how much we justify it in our head or talk about it or say that we are or go off and do our own thing. Well, yeah, but I'm I'm working over here in, in a food pantry now. I'm over here working in here. So that's, listen, you can do it your way all day long, but if that's not God's way of doing it, then you're in disobedience and rebellion. We are, be, we are to be connected to a local body of believers, unified as one family, one community, submitted to the elders and submitted to one another. Learning the apostles' teachings together, which is the word of God, commute, taking communion together, which is the remembrance of what Christ has done for us through the taking of the, of the bread and the wine or grape juice, we are to be going house to house, know each other, learn about each other. We are to rejoice with one another when we are rejoicing. We're to mourn with one another when we're mourning. We are to be a family. And when then we're to be out there going out into the community and sharing this glorious gospel, this glorious good news that has been given to us, we are supposed to be handing it to others. We're supposed to be worshiping him, using our gifts for one another. We'll be giving of our time and our talent and our treasure to get the work done. And we don't get to decide, like, you know, God shows us. God has, shows us where to put our time, talent, and treasure. We put it in the local body first to get the work of the gospel done. Then from there, we put it out into the lost. This body understood that. The Philippian church, though a poor persecuted church, was giving money and supplies and aid to Paul, who was in Rome in prison. They were taking and making sure that no one had a need, including their brother, Paul, who established the church in prison in Rome, though they were in Philippi. And that's why Paul commended them so much in chapter one. He loved this church. He saw their love. But now he has to address that there's a problem. And it terrifies him to think that this church could be completely dismantled because a couple people cannot submit to one another and cannot submit to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he is reminding them that whatever problem you have, whatever, whatever thing this is, look at what God did. Look what Jesus did. Are you greater than Jesus? Humble yourself. Think of others greater than yourself. Sacrifice. Lay your lives down for each other. Let this other stuff go so that you can be focused on the end game. Jesus was focused on the end game, and that was reconciling souls to the Father. Giving a way where there was no way for the nations to be saved. Shedding his own blood as the ransom paid for your sin and my sin debt. So that he could have a bride onto himself, a family in which he was the head and we are bride, that, that body. Right? Are we disappointing him? I'm sure Paul was disappointed to hear that there was this disunity going on. And we'll talk about that again when we get up, up to chapter um, four. But let us 
But as we're going to go into next week, let us work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Let us get our eyes focused back on Christ, the finished work of the cross, and the purpose for our salvation. And what it means to be the church. What it means to be the body and Christ the head. And what it means to be brothers and sisters, and family and community. We need to be praying. So Lord, I just lift up the body of believers that will be listening to this particular message, Father. And I pray that as your word does pierce through us like a sword, and it pierces through that bone and that marrow, it pierces through the pride, it pierces through the disunity, it pierces through the sin. It also brings healing and, and exhortation and edifies us and builds us up and corrects us. It does all the things. We thank you for this glorious word that you've left us with and help us to uh, continue to just learn it and, and, and rightly divide it and, and consume it, eat it like a scroll. But let us not just be hearers of the word, Lord. Let us be doers of the word. Let us see where there's been disunity. Let us repent of our part in any type of disunity that has happened in the body. And let us work and strive for unity as you've told us to do that. We're to strive for it and help us to get back on track, Lord, if we've gotten off track. And Father, if there is anyone listening to this that doesn't have a home church, it's not connected to a body of believers, it's not building the church together in a consistent, submissive manner, help them to find a true body of believers that puts the Bible and the word of God as preeminent, Christ as the head, and it's all about him. I pray that they find a Bible teaching church or community of believers that are sold out to the gospel of Jesus Christ and that make the word of God first and foremost by the spirit of God and that they love one another and they strive for unity and they, they worship together and they pray together and they play together too and they're just this family and that they also are out there reaching the community of the lost and loving the lost and loving the least of these. Help each and every one of them find that place, Lord, wherever they may be. And deal with all of us, Father, because we all fall short of the glory. We all fall short. We've all operated in disunity. We've all operated in division. We've all um, not thought of others greater than ourselves. We've all been selfish and prideful and wanted it our way. We've all gone to the place of Burger King. And forgive us, Lord. We pray that you bring things back together that are meant to be together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Feel free to contact me um, at www.bethechurchministry.com. God bless you.